Uh, hello, my name is um, Jan von Zweibeck, and as you understand, I'm from IBM. Nice to meet you all. I, I would like to express our appreciation and thank you for your trust that we have been given to the opportunity to present our solution here connected to open EHR. And as you also said, we, we have given our consent just to record this demo session for, for further uh, uh, information. And we can take the next slide, please. Yeah, probably you already know IBM in any way, but uh, I will tell in a short of sentence then, it's one of the largest IT companies here in the world. We have uh, approximately 360,000 employees in 170 countries. We support our clients by, for example, utilizing AI, automation, hybrid cloud, and other digital te technologies in order to achieve things like leveraging data and drive integrated workflows, faster and smarter decision-making, real-time response to disruptive events. This is a couple of things that we are actually helping our clients. And uh, as probably many of you already know that we are currently active here in the Swedish marketplace though, related to EHR and EMR through our projects related to just region Skåne and uh, VGR in just implementing Millennium together with uh, Oracle Cerner. And uh, one of our partners in the healthcare space is just Vita Group. And I am very happy to introduce you to Stefan that will shortly present a couple of sentences related to his company. Please, yes. Stefan. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, very quickly about Vita Group uh, for the ones that who don't know us yet. Uh, we're actually not a, a very young company. We're 23 years uh, in business. We have one sole shareholder who's one of the SAP founders, Mr. Dr. Hector, uh, who has uh, supported Vita Group over the last 23 years. And uh, what is important to say is that for the past, past five years, uh, we've uh, followed a very consistent approach in regards of uh, being a strong believer of vendor independent open ecosystem solutions. Uh, so we have uh, uh, implemented our platform strategy uh, which is uh, all around focused uh, of vendor neutral uh, healthcare platforms. Uh, and uh, as such, uh, we are for the past uh, four to five years also a leader in open air solutions, uh, following a product uh, approach. But of course, we know that uh, you know, the projects that uh, we are currently delivering, it's, it's, uh, it's a solution based business. So it's always a product core uh, consisting of the platform strategy which is tied into a solution. Uh, and of course, we also do uh, know-how transfer and building up uh, whatever is uh, necessary to, um, uh, to support this kind of approach. Uh, and therefore, we also follow a consultancy approach. Uh, so this is Vita Group in a nutshell. We are 350 people currently, um, and 150 are focused uh, on the platform approach. Yeah. And one of the things that we are also happy to share with you that you actually perhaps have been seeing that we have used a, a great collaboration just in in uh, in, uh, in Catalonia, where we just implementing an open source uh, CDR. And uh, in this presentation and demo, we will uh, actually present you a couple of uh, examples related to just this case in Catalonia in order just to inspire you, but also in in, in the sense of what is our solution and our capabilities. And uh, perhaps we will give you a, a further exploration when you're just choosing the best provider in the, in the, in the, in the space of your open EHR. Next slide, please. Yeah. And uh, I'm just, I just wanted to start and say that we are really proud to just be able to present a very strong and competent team though just covering most areas that could be relevant in this kind of type of digital transformation. As, you, as I earlier said, my name is just Jan von Zweiberg and I am the responsible partner for ABM here for healthcare and life science in Sweden. I have many, many years of experience in running larger digital transformation projects. 
But I also want to present my colleague, Perrine Andersson, who is your particular focus on supporting our clients in just establishing system tools, processes to just effectively run on their business. And that's also included as implementation integration aspects. And then uh, not only from, from the Swedish team, we have also um, a participant from our, uh, our Spanish team, our colleague, colleague Augustine, he's a solution architect in Spain. He, uh, worth mentioning that he, he has been instrumental in our cooperation with Vita Group on implementing an open source just in, in, in Catalonia. So this is the, the team from, from, from IBM. And now I will let uh, Stefan shortly present uh, your great Vita2 group team. Yes. Let me start with myself. Uh, I'm Stefan Schwabs. Uh, I'm vice president in Vita Group for business and community management. But I have a couple of more roles. Uh, at the same time, I'm responsible uh, business owner for Airbase, our open source uh, distribution. Uh, and are also responsible for the large uh, international projects all around open air based projects. Uh, and uh, so now for five years with Vita Group, but in the healthcare space since 2005. Uh, I've brought uh, Birger Habrand and Daniel Blair with me. Birger uh, uh, is product manager for the HIP CDR, our commercial distribution basically all around uh, air base. Uh, and uh, you know a, a main driver basically for our platform strategy and uh, the technical approach in regards of this. Uh, both um, Berger and myself are also members and directors in the Open Air International. Uh, so we are from different angles. Uh, Berger more from the technical side. I'm more from the business uh, and community side. Uh, so this is, our, this is us. And Daniel is our, um, uh, a solution architect uh, for Open Air Solutions. Uh, that will also present some of the uh, precise and direct uh, things uh, that we will show. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. I mean, as you see, the, um, we have really put together a strong team, though, in order just to have the best of the best, though, and a great combination of just both leadership and technical expertise in consulting and your system integration, as well as Stefan mentioned, leadership in open EHR solutions. Um, so, before we start the demo, next please, uh, slide please. Yeah, before we start, I just want to just describe a little how we envision this demo. We intend to set on the other side about one and a half hours for the demo and 30 minutes for any questions then. And for example, some of the things that we are just going to present, we have just done the introduction as you see. Uh, we will start with a, an uh, overview of just the, the, uh, our common solution in the CDR product, Open HR space. And then we'll Paringe, have a short, short introduction of the, the user case and, and the personas that we are going to present to you then, that we will follow the, the, the whole entire demo session. And uh, the next one is just uh, offering uh, a, a persona called Kode as an application application and content development and administrator. And we are talking about all from integration, terminal legacy services, managing attached files, metadata and access control. And then we will talk to Amina, who is a platform administrator, a technician, uh, and her struggle to use providing support, monitoring performance. And then we have a persona called Earl as a physician, a super end user how he will uh, manage to follow up patients and how we will uh, use in the open EHR platform to just work on research. And the last one is uh, Nova, who is presented as an external developer and how in which way he, she is using the documentation and how we can uh, uh, handle a custom app integrating EHR base. And then we'll, Stefan and I, have a short uh, uh, summary and conclusion of this demo, and then we will start uh, the questions um, at, the, at the end. So that, this is our agenda. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, no, no, no we have just made the, the, the introduction and what we intend to cover in this session. 
Now, it's, uh, as I said before, it's time to start the demo according to the requirements that you will present in Tustin. And we will start just the, the story with a short high level overview, just a, a, a quick introduction of the sub software for a better context for you. And what is the Vita Growth software on a high level? So I am happy to introduce Birrier, I think, that will help us to better understand this. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I hope that you can now see um, this overview of our uh, HIPCDR platform. And what can be said first is that we are not only providing an open air server, um, but it's a complete platform for the healthcare system, including different integration capabilities and uh, management capabilities. So from a high level point of view, it's a cloud native uh, architecture. So we are natively building on Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift for containerization. And once you are starting an instance of HIPCDR, you are at the moment starting around 40 services. So technically it's not a microservice architecture, it's a service oriented architecture because some services are bigger, some are smaller, um, but this makes the whole architecture highly extensible and flexible. And at the same time, this is something that you can get out of the box. So we have a high level description of the containerization through hand charts, which means that you can easily deploy the whole platform and it will work right away, including different uh, kinds of integration. So when you take a look at uh, the bubble uh, in the middle, you will see at the bottom uh, different storages. And so this is really the centerpiece of the platform with Airbase as an open source based open air server. Uh, but at the same time, we are also respecting the separation of demographic data and clinical data. We're introducing the fire demographic service and we are using the uh, HP, which is highly extended in our case for a demographic service and for other fire related uh, aspects. Optionally, you can also introduce a multimedia storage uh, in accordance with the uh, F3 uh, standard. We have a shared security layer across all the different uh, services. Um, Keyclock is the uh, identity provider and the services are communicating using a message protocol, a message queue based on RabbitMQ, could also be um, the Kafka. And in some cases, we also have direct REST communication uh, across the services. What needs to be mentioned is that the whole platform is multi-tenant aware. So this means that all the different aspects of the platform will have a logical data separation, which will allow you to have your single instance based on the same infrastructure. Yeah, so keep this in mind for um, the further presentation. So on top, you see one important layer, which is the integration layer, and we have one component, uh, which is key, and we will go into uh, details uh, during this presentation. So this is called CDR bridge, and the CDR bridge provides a series of connectors to different data sources, because we always have to integrate into hospital information systems or into the um, um, the uh, different systems outside the hospital, GP systems, and uh, so we have some um, different connectors and a uh, language, a uh, domain specific language to define mappings. On the right hand side, um, we also have the different APIs, including Fire API and Open Air API. Fire API um, is something that we are developing as we go. So we are concentrating mainly on the Open Air API, providing full support and Fire API um, as we go. And then we can also integrate with external services. Uh, today we will show how we can integrate with an external fire terminology service. But of course, there's also always the question how we integrate with a master patient index. And so because of the extensibility of the platform, uh, we can take care of this as well. Um, additionally, we have some aspects around software development kits and other utilities which are not represented here, uh, but we might come to that a bit later. And I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah, let me take on uh, uh, this slide, please, uh, because uh, I think what is very uh, important if you want to understand our platform philosophy uh, is that we are uh, taking it probably one step further to the typical platform approaches, uh, because our true belief is that uh, all 
uh, dependencies uh, even to certain platforms, even if you have independent data modeling uh, and, and, and data models in place, and if even if it differentiates uh, the logic uh, from the uh, data layer uh, and from the applications, and you have one data source in place, uh, you still have kind of dependencies if you don't follow an open source approach. Uh, this was one of the main decision uh, factors in, uh, in Catalonia to make the choice on the Vita Group CDR. Uh, because uh, even if you know uh, you have investment security uh, not dependent on Vita Group or IBM uh, for the next generation, and what you will want to build up is basically something for the next generation healthcare IT, which is based basically on this CDR. And uh, so what we have uh, uh, taken on is that uh, around every successful technology that has been adopted uh, in the world in the last decades. Uh, there's always at least one open source approach uh, that is truly maintained and uh, continuously uh, developed further uh, in regards of, um, uh, you know, having support from uh, industry drivers. Uh, so when we actually analyzed the situation with open air, like five years ago, when we went into the space, we identified that there is no, not a really sustainable investment and community capable uh, open source um, uh, approach there and what we have done together with, uh, with the HIMIT consortium uh, we have uh, found basically uh, airbase and uh, we have continuously developed uh, for the past four years I, I think airbase to where it is today so everything what uh, is uh, core um, uh, in the HIP CDR approach and in the HIP CDR platform uh, is based on the nucleus that is Airbase. Um, and uh, uh, for at least for the care data, uh, of course, there's other data as you have seen in this architectural slide uh, before, uh, that is uh, also might be fire based or uh, if it comes, comes for example to demographic data, uh, also, this is uh, based on Harpy Fire, which is not maintained from us, but which is, uh, I think, an open source approach, which is also uh, community capable and uh, well known in the industry. Uh, so this together is basically the foundation of the HIP CDR. But then, of course, there's a lot more around this. Uh, you want uh, guaranteed service levels. You want uh, features, tools, plugins. Uh, it should be maintainable. It should also be uh, usable. Uh, so usability issues, security issues, uh, but also if it comes to scalability issues, all of, all of this is basically uh, in uh, uh, considered in the HIP CDR in the commercial approach. Uh, but uh, even if uh, at a certain stage uh, you would come to the conclusion that Vita Group and IBM would not be, uh, you know, the right partner for this anymore. You would not not fall back to zero. You would fall back to something which is, you know, air based and Harpy Fire based. So this would allow you investment security, or uh, and this was one very important decision making factor in Catalonia as well. Next slide, please. Okay. When <clears throat> when we start looking into the use cases that are included in your uh, request. We, uh, we want to, to build uh, personas around this. So, so we actually try to, to make a, a character uh, around each of the roles and also provide some context from a local perspective where it's suitable and uh, help explain the functionality, both in terms of, of an overview and also in uh, some hands-on demonstrations. So if we move to the next slide, um, we have uh, defined these four main roles that we will uh, address in the presentation. And the first one is the internal developer, Cody, that actually uh, works uh, to develop application, build integrations, information modeling, and so forth. And, and is a, a quite advanced user uh, around this um, uh, platform and, and requires some, some, some uh, functional and, and smart tools. And then we have Amina, that is the administrator and, and the technician in, in uh, this demo that uh, is concerned about being able to support the, the end users and also support the uh, upkeeping of the platform itself. So she looks for tools that, that helps her uh, look at the diagnostics, uh, check performance of services, help troubleshooting and so forth. 
And then we have Earl, that is the doctor that is uh, driving development of, of uh, new uh, forms and also uh, conducts research based on uh, the data in the uh, open EHR. And he uh, also helps his department to generate reports and, and uh, overview of, of the status of, of the patient that they are currently having under, under uh, home care, uh, home monitoring. And then finally, we have Nova, that is an external uh, developer that works in a private company and that uh, also wants to uh, develop apps that are compatible with uh, open EHR and, and HIPCDR. And she, of course, is interested in the openness of the REST APIs and, and also needs support in terms of uh, good documentation and uh, an active community so she can get uh, started and resolve the issues that she encounters when developing. Next, please. So when we are looking in at the first actual use case, uh, our internal developer coding, he wants to integrate software and, and also be able to uh, connect to, to uh, uh, legacy proprietary softwares and use them alongside with an open EHR and open EHR applications that are built for, for the healthcare. And also wants to uh, implement functionality through the Fire API. And we believe that uh, this is of great importance, of course, because we will not change everything in one day. And there is a lot of proprietary systems out there, including Millennium that we are implementing now in a couple of, of the regions uh, represented. And as Berger uh, addressed a bit earlier, we offer this functionality via the, the CDR bridge. And uh, Daniel, can you please show us a little bit about how that works? Yeah, sure. So if we want to talk about how data is uh, coming into our HIP CDR. We first need to know uh, the CDR is a kind of interoperable database for structured health data. Um, however, this health data is rarely available in, uh, in structured formats such as open air or fire. And uh, therefore we need some conversion. And this, uh, this is the main, um, the main focus of the CDR bridge. Um, if we try to explain um, what the CD bridge is or uh, what it does, I'm always uh, I always like to compare it with a translator. Um, if we imagine two people trying to communicate, uh, which are from different countries, uh, for example from Sweden and from Germany, they don't understand each other. They need something like a translator, and the same uh, applies to our system actors that want to communicate with uh, medical standards. Um, they are speaking together, but they don't understand each other. And that's uh, the point where our HIP CDA, HIP CDR uh, comes in. Um, the main uh, part of this um, understanding or translation are our so-called mappings. They are something like a key feature of our CDR or of our CDR bridge. Um, and what it does is, we, uh, if we look at data like uh, HL7v2 messages or, or an observation coming from fire uh, that comes from a hosp hospital, um, this message is first sent to one of our uh, connectors that we can see here on the slides. And uh, yeah, these uh, connectors act like uh, yeah, like a bridge or a door to the to the CDR. And uh, in the bridge. We check, okay, which which data is that that just came here, and uh, the bridge search uh, for a mapping that is, uh, yeah, capable of handling this conversion from this uh, from this uh, message. In our case, uh, we want to map these messages to a, a open air data store for medical data, or to fire store for demographics. Um, one big point that I need to mention is that uh, our mappings are bidirectional. That means um, if I send a V2 message uh, from a, yeah, a hospital or something uh, to the CDR bridge, and then it's mapped to, uh, to Airbase, it's uh, always possible that I can get something like uh, this blood pressure that I just um, sent back to the hospital in uh, the V2 uh, format 
that I just uh, send it. And um, well, another big picture, a uh, big feature of our bridge is that we are capable of uh, doing a normalization of the messages or the data. One example uh, would be if we get some HL7 v2 messages, there are several versions of this uh, that are used. And yeah, we try to, uh, to normalize it to one version here. Now, if we go a little bit deeper into the uh, so-called mappings that are doing this conversion, we just need uh, to know that we have three types of mappings. Uh, the first one uh, are the structured mappings, which are yeah, uh, structured, uh, the custom mapping, sorry, which are structured and uh, unique per tenant. They can be maintained by, uh, by a customer or a client. So that means that you, that you are able to, to define or to write your own mappings with your own data structure after you got some uh, training uh, by us. Um, the second uh, uh, type of mapping is the enhanced mapping. They are also structured. Um, you could think about something uh, or mappings that handle something like uh, names of uh, patients or the address of the patient, some basic values that you uh, see most of the time and they are part of the product by default. So part of the HIP CDR. Um, the third are the base mappings. They are unstructured and uh, also part of the product. They save the message as a whole. And um, now there's uh, something like a mapping hierarchy that we use. This is shown here on the, on the left picture. That means uh, when we receive data in the, uh, in the CDR bridge, um, there's always the question, okay, do we find a custom mapping for this kind of data? If not, we search for uh, enhanced mappings. And if we also don't have enhanced mappings, we try to use base mapping. And um, also uh, one point that is mentioned uh, that's, uh, that's worth mentioning is that we can map uh, or that we can uh, select single fields uh, out of a message and map them to different data stores. So it could be that you have a HL7v2 message with a, a PID segment where uh, the demographics of the patients uh, are transmitted. And these uh, normally go to the demographic store. But we can also have in the same message, uh, something like an OBX segment where uh, some observation results are uh, transmitted. And these uh, are medical data and uh, they come to the Air base. To understand a little bit uh, yeah, deeper what we're doing here in the mappings, we need to mention that we use the protocol specific path language, PSPL, uh, that we use to map these uh, data from our source to our target data stores. Um, yeah, PSPL is a kind of formal representation of a data extraction language. Uh, which can uh, yeah, map data from various uh, source protocols like V2, Fire, or other stuff. Um, yeah, only with uh, this PSPL, it's uh, possible to connect uh, different medical and non-medical source protocols to our target data structures. Um, to understand this a little bit deeper, we can uh, look at these pictures on the right, um, right above here. You can see a PID segment of a HL7 v2 message. So uh, we see a yeah, very basic PID segment with uh, the name of the patient. So the last name and the first name, uh, the date of birth and the gender, and uh, some kind of ID here. And what we're doing here is we're using a PSPL here in the middle to specify, OK, which value do we want to map to which uh, to which target database and target field. So the, the source field is specified right here in the source path. So it's PID 5.1. So that means we search in the PID segment, what we can see here in the fifth uh, um, field that's here. And there we wanna have the first value. So this is the last name Smith. And this value needs to be mapped to uh, this a target um, field in a fire store. So 
to a name dot family field. Um, in fire, it would look like this to this field here. So, and if we try to um, to to show which field this is with the PSPL, it's a uh, name dot family because we are here in the name, and then we want to have the family. So this is um, roughly how mappings work and how we can specify mappings. And yeah, for this, I want to show you a little demonstration video, another video, is a live demonstration of our CDR bridge and how the data comes into the CDR and on which ways um, it is possible to bring data into the CDR. So let me just uh, show you one little application uh, UI that we built. And before we start, um, it's uh, worth mentioning that um, this is the first way uh, I want to show you to get data into the CDR with HL7 V2. Um, what we have here is a little UI that uh, can be used to simulate a patient admission with HL7 V2. So um, we have the possibility to create uh, this V2 message with uh, some patient information by just typing it here in these little uh, boxes and text fields and then uh, just gener generating uh, the message when we click to this button. Uh, but we will see this now. So let's create an ADT A01 message, which stands for normal admission. And let's just type in a name. So it's Tom Miller, and we can just type in a random ID at the moment for demonstration. And we're just specifying a birth date and the gender. Now we can click uh, create message. And you see that there is a little uh, HS7v2 message uh, created on the fly. We can also uh, paste in any existing uh, HS7v2 message uh, here, but it's a little bit nicer when we just can, um, yeah, when it's just can create it uh, with this tool here. So um, if we send this data now, it's sent to the HS, uh, to our CDR, we can try to check, okay, uh, is the data there? For this, we can uh, just log in to a little uh, so-called patient viewer in the role of a doctor. So Maximilian Meyer is a doctor in this case. Oops, I need to reload the page, one second. So now we logged in and we can click on this little icon here on the left. And, and then we can see uh, a list of all patients that the doctor is, uh, of, uh, where the doctor is allowed to see. And uh, then we can see that uh, Tom Miller that we just created is there. And um, what is uh, what it's uh, worth mentioning is that he has an air ID, which is our identificator for the hip CDR. So every patient has uh, one single unique air ID. And um, on the left side, we see the personal data of uh, Tom Miller, uh, the debris name, the last name, the gender. So we see that the um, data that we just typed in in the HL7v2 standard is mapped to our uh, demographic store and shown here in a structured way. Um, yeah, next thing I wanna show is we can go to history here. So this is the German word for history. And we can see that there is the whole message that we just sent uh, stored. And uh, yeah, next thing that's uh, very interesting for you, we can uh, specify something like uh, trigger events on our HIP CDR. And if I create a patient, I can uh, start a workflow. For this, I just got an email from our business process engine, which um, sends me this link. And when I click to this link, I start a workflow with Kamunda. 
just takes a while. Okay, then I need to uh, log in. And what I see here is a little uh, kind of form for our patient, Tom Miller, with uh, the patient number that I just specified. And uh, the form is about a little, yeah, uh, uh, is about the amnesis. So we can uh, specify some values like the, the body weight. So this is the German word for body weight, blood pressure systolic, blood pressure diastolic, um, uh, blood, uh, uh, blood oxygen percentage and a comment. And yeah, we can just try to type this in. But uh, one feature that I just, uh, that we, uh, that I want to show is when I just uh, type in uh, weight, this is uh, what is really not normal, way too high, 1,200 uh, kilogram, we get a little error message here that the maximum value is 300. So let's uh, type in that, he's, uh, that he has uh, 90 kilogram and a blood pressure of 120 to 80 and 99% uh, blood uh, oxygen and our comment is test. So um, now we can uh, send this and check if uh, if it's uh, right here in our little viewer for our doctor. I reload the page. Maybe just to, to complement, so this is now using the OpenAir API for integration. I just wanted uh, to say, so this is the second way that we can, uh, where we can uh, bring data to the CDA about uh, yeah, open air form or open air application. And uh, what we see here is that the data that we just typed in is also here in a, in a structured way because it's loaded directly from our open air store as a so-called um, composition. So, um, Next, we can show uh, another tool that's based on open air and sends data to the CDR. Therefore, I need to log out myself and re-log in as Ulrike Hörig. She is a patient. And what we see right now is a uh, yeah, a little kind of uh, patient app. Um, yeah, which um, yeah can can uh, be such a thing as a as a monitoring app after a hospitalization of a of a patient where uh, he or she can keep track of her uh, vital signs, and they are illustrated here in a, in a little chart. And uh, for sure, we can uh, add some data points here with the plus. And what we can see here is again, the body weight, the blood sugar and the blood pressure. And so let's try to add a value. So the value was measured today at 3 p.m. And the weight was 77 kilogram. If I save this, I see that there's another point in a uh, our little chart and I can also add blood sugar also at 3 p.m. and we can specify some, met uh, some methods uh, how the blood sugar was measured and the value so let's say 86 and if we save this we can uh, log out again and uh, rewatch as a doctor if the data is uh, taken over correctly. So again, as Maximilian Meyer. So now we need to choose uh, Ulrike Hörig. And if we go to history here, we see that there are several uh, values, uh, measurement values, and the last two are the ones that I just uh, typed in. If we go to it, we can see that the glucose is uh, 86, the blood sugar that we uh, that we typed in, and the 
uh, body weight is 77. So this is also a um, kind of example how we can uh, get some open air data about uh, over an uh, open air application to our HIP CDR. Um, one uh, last way I want to show you how to get data to the HIP CDR is uh, via FHIR. And for this, we use our little helper tool, Postman, where we can send requests to, to our HIP CDI endpoints. And yeah, the interesting part is I can uh, yeah, create um, blood, pressure, uh, blood pressure again with uh, this fire um, request. Um, but it, there we need to mention that we need to have a template in the background to uh, send this uh, fire blood pressure to uh, our CTR because the blood pressure needs to be mapped from fire to our open air server where the medical data is stored. So uh, let's do a little change here. We can see, okay, we have uh, a observation, uh, a fire observation, and we can change the value again a little bit that we can see how it works. and quickly send it. Now we have error, I just need to reload. Yeah, now it works. Just a little time out, I think. Okay, uh, what's important here? We just created a so-called composition again, so data in uh, in open air that uh, relies on a on an open air template, and uh, we just created this this little uh, composition, and therefore we uh, get a observation I, uh, uh, composition ID, this one. So if we copy this right now and log in to a little another tool that we provide the so-called CDR Explorer. I'm just logging in as a tenant admin. And again, need to reload. I can switch to English here. So. So now we are on our tenant and we are in a role of a tenant administrator. And as a tenant administrator, I wanna see which open air data just uh, came in my CDR. Uh, later we get a little bit, uh, or we go a little bit more into detail into this feature, but we can just paste our composition ID in here and then search it. And we see, okay, here is a composition based on the template ID that we see here, blood pressure, uh, so on. And we see the system source where it came from. And what we also see is the air ID because every composition needs to be assigned to a patient or to an air ID. And yeah, that's the third part, how we can get data into our HIP CDR. So with every uh, medical standard we are capable to handle. So now I want to hand over to Pear again. Oh, stop. I just need to go to the right slide. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, the next issue that, that Cody has uh, is about getting good and consistent data from all these different sources that uh, Daniel just showed you. So if we have an integration, for example, via Pyre from, from uh, another EMR system, we want to ensure that all the data in our HIP CDR is compliant with a certain uh, uh, standard. And uh, in this case, we want to show you how you can set up a uh, validation uh, based on, on the Pyre R4. And also that uh, we can see that um, 
if we enter an incorrect value, uh, we get a, a rejection. So the data is not written to the database. It's uh, instead create an error message. Uh, I just wanted to say also that we are running a bit late, about 10 minutes over time. So if we can please just uh, show this quickly. Uh, and uh, we will hand over to Berger to, to show this. Yes, uh, thanks a lot. Um, so what I will show you now is how you can activate the external terminology service um, validation in uh, HIPCDR and Airbase. And uh, we will do this on the example of the uh, Onto server product from CSIRO in this Australian company. Um, so we will see how we will create one composition and a false um, entry for the value set. We're getting rejected and then afterwards we correct ourselves. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, yeah, just for the technical people in the audience, uh, this is how you would set the validation. Uh, and the message here is that you will see the URL for this uh, public uh, onto server uh, instance. So this is what we are going to use for the presentation. So keeping us crossed, it's online at the moment, uh, but should be. And uh, then we also see that the external terminology validation is enabled. And if we are seeing an error, um, the validation is going to fail. So I will try to flip the screen. And I think Daniel will have to close um, this sharing so that I can take over. So that's what. Right. So what you should see here is uh, the tool snapper uh, and just to give you a quick introduction of what we are trying to do here um, so we see the value set which is about uh, cancer surgery procedures so this is what is in the title and there are different codes describing these uh, surgery procedures as you can see here and this value set is based on snowmet ct and I think as Sweden has a national license, this is going to be quite interesting. It's one of the leading um, terminologies. So now we can go to our postman. And what you see here is how we are doing uh, the terminology binding in an open air template. So it's based on the fire standard. It requires an expand operation and we find the name of the value set here. And once we're trying to build a composition based on this template, like we do here, so this is the flat format, which is also fully supported by Airbase, then you see here the human readable name, you see the code, and you see the terminology. And as you can see here, this is clearly wrong. So. Once we are sending the data, we expect this to be rejected. So let's see what happens. Yes, so we're getting this bad request. And we see that value wrong does not match any option from the value set, which is containing the procedure codes. So the data will not be stored in HIPCDR and in Airbase. So when we remove this, we are correctly getting the 201. So the data has been created. And that's already about it regarding the topic of uh, terminology service uh, validation. And then I think I will go on with the presentation. Give me a sec. The main issue is that there's so many things happening from Zoom that I can't see my own screen at the moment. That should be fine. All okay, right. so <clears throat> when we, we move on to the next issue that our developer Cody has, uh, there is uh, a need to not only store data as, as uh, Berger just showed, but also to address the need for uh, binaries and uh, images and, and other data, so to say, that is not um, that is in a file format. 
and uh, Airbase, as you know, doesn't really support attachments uh, on its own, but we can still uh, store a connection to the file and then store the file in a, a separate uh, repository. Uh, when we uh, won the uh, work in Catalonia, we, we actually um, uh, proposed a solution for this that I wanted to ask uh, Augustine from, from, from our Spanish uh, team to, to just uh, give a brief introduction to. Okay, thank you, Pierre. So here the idea is to explain how our base allows storing PDF documents and images uh, that are associated to the composition and etc. Okay. Uh, for this storage, uh, the solution that we are going to realize for the region of Catalonia is proposed. Um, it is based on the use of the XDS profile. Okay, uh, this profile is used so that the documents are stored in a document repository, while the Open EHR repository, raw archetypes and templates structure acts as a document registry. Okay. Uh, registering the document metadata, that is the XDS metadata, uh, and the directory where the document is hosted. Okay, so something that's very important here is that uh, the storage of the documents will be done through API restoring the documents in a document repository, okay, and inserting the corresponding composition in the OpenEHR repository with a reference to the document directory by means of URI. Uh, the, the transaction are in line with the integration model models included in IHE, that is the integrating the healthcare enterprise. So, okay, so you can continue, Per. Thank you. Okay, next slide, please. So, uh, uh, when we look from uh, uh, an administrative perspective, we uh, we want to to use metadata to be able to understand and uh, control who gets access to what data in the system, and uh, in this case we also have some specific Swedish legislation as you are probably very well aware of uh, in in the PDL or or the patient data law. And, and we just wanted to, to walk through a, a brief example of how we could work with uh, the HIP CDR and some uh, uh, external components to, to uh, enable that type of control. Uh, next, please. So in, in this simple example, we have uh, two uh, clinicians. We have a, a psychologist and a, a general practitioner that works in two different organizations within Region Östergötland. And uh, as you know, we have an option for patients to opt out from uh, common records keeping, sammanhållen journalföring. And in this case, the patient, Lisa, has uh, excised this right. So, so she doesn't want the GP to know what she, uh, have, uh, that, that she is visiting uh, the psychologist, for example. And in this case, we want to uh, add some metadata to the uh, uh, assigned roles for uh, the clinical staff. So both of them have access rights as clinic, uh, clinical staff uh, through their uh, labeling, but we also label them based on which unit they belong to. So in this case, Tencapio Psychiatry uh, and Valla Vård Central respectively. And when we do this, we uh, uh, are able to restrict the access because when Johanna is, is creating a, a record, the, uh, the organizational belonging that she has is encoded in that uh, uh, note, so to say. And since we can uh, do an, an, an external identity uh, validation, for example, through the, the SITS system, we can uh, actually say that, okay, uh, if the middleware doesn't uh, see that your login is from the same organization as the tagging of the record in question, we can restrict access. So if Henrik tries to open the records, then we uh, don't, don't allow that if it's written by, by Johanna in this case. So uh, if we put this into a context, uh, can you please uh, talk us through how this works in, in the HIP CDR? 
Yes. I will give an overview and maybe also give some, let's say, uh, room for discussion later, uh, because access control is uh, quite a tricky topic, uh, as you know. And so maybe we can provide some insights where we are right now in our thinking and uh, how this can uh, maybe be applied uh, in this scenario as well. So what we are basically providing, uh, let's say it's a basic uh, access control, is a role-based access control using the uh, key clock capabilities, including policy uh, enforcement. But as we just learned, typically this is not enough uh, because scopes and permissions on a role base um, doesn't provide the whole context uh, of a patient. So what we are currently working on um, is the so-called uh, attribute-based access control using um, XML. So this is the extensible access control markup language. And um, so we have multiple stages on what we implement. So one of the first stages is having the same feature set um, to restrict access, like we find the key clock just for the streamlining of technology. And currently we have uh, one, um, let's say proof of concept implementation that I will explain now, not in live demo, but uh, maybe to give you some, some theoretical um, background where we are in the uh, process. Um, we have this restriction on uh, the requests. So imagine you are sending an AQL query and then you have a specified payload. So you are sending a request to the system. And our approach defines a set of extractors. And these extractors are depending on this type of data being sent. So this could be a fire resource being sent. It could be an open air composition being sent. It could be a query being sent. And staying on the example of the query, you have an extractor. And in our case, it's technically, not for the technical people, an AQL parser. And we will formally check what kind of data fields are part of this specific query. And then we can define a policy and allow access or deny access. So this means we have some examples here. We have this uh, non-healthcare provider who's trying to access a diagnosis template. And if there's an ad hoc query being sent, the system will analyze, extract the payload, the query, and take a look if this template is part of the query. And of course, at the same time, we wouldn't forbid or we wouldn't allow any queries which are not containing any restrictions on the template. Uh, otherwise, it would not be that sensible. Of course, next level then would be that we would also analyze the data that's uh, coming back. So what is the result that's being requested? Uh, but this is what we are going to address down the road uh, this year. And uh, so far, this means we are um, considering the role, um, the permissions, and also the request, but not, let's say, the response. Response would then be next uh, level. And uh, so it's, it's a bit tricky because uh, with AQL, you have lots of um, complexity. And uh, so we will have to figure out what is the right set of attributes that makes sense uh, to um, uh, express in this way. Uh, relating to the example um, provided, um, we can also then integrate, for example, open air text. This could also be a good approach where this is explicitly um, being expressed what kind of parameters on the clinical data should be considered for such access control. So hope this gives you some, some insight where we are in the process of establishing the executable. Moving on to the next uh, persona, that is Amina, that, that works in IT in the region and uh, works with uh, server administration and, and supports end users that have issues with accessing the HIPCDR and, and related services, and also uh, works with keeping, keeping everything running uh, smoothly. And we will show you a couple of tools related to this. Uh, first, the CDR Explorer and how we can use that to actually troubleshoot. And, and also how we can use the hosting itself in terms of Kubernetes and, and containers to 
provide data on on the status and, and the uh, health, so to say, of uh, individual services or individual containers. Please. Yeah, I think for this, uh, Daniel will, will grab the yeah. screen. So I hope you see my screen now. And uh, yeah, as an administrator, I want to, to see what's happening in my system. And uh, yeah, one big point is the uh, system management or the container status that we um, can check with the HIPCDR. Uh, as Birger mentioned uh, at the beginning, HIPCDR is developed uh, on a cloud native uh, infrastructure uh, for Kubernetes and OpenShift. Um, yeah. And uh, because of that, we have yeah very much uh, tools for admins, um, uh, which uh, yeah where they can uh, monitor their their uh, pods and containers. One of them is uh, Rancher, what you can see on the right. Uh, there, an administrator can see if his pods and containers are running correctly. Another big point is the system monitoring. Therefore, we, we also have uh, some tools uh, like a combination of uh, Prometheus, uh, Grafana, and Loki, uh, which uh, allow us uh, yeah, to extensively uh, monitoring everything that we have. We are able to search uh, for log files uh, from all of our uh, services and see the network traffic, uh, check the system availability, this was uh, would look like uh, this here on the right. Um, one other big point is uh, that we use Adna logging for yeah nearly everything that happens in the CDR. So if uh, there are some uh, creations, uh, some uh, read um, access uh, operations and stuff like this, we document this with Adna. And uh, these logs can be stored in uh, Elastic Stack or can be integrated with uh, some customer customer uh, logging uh, repositories. And um, yeah, therefore we also use a tool called Kibana, what we can see on the right, to search uh, through these Adna logs. And just a short uh, demonstration again. We already saw our uh, admin dashboard the cdi explorer and we also already saw that we can filter here through uh, some uh, compositions that uh, we created we can check where they came from um, we can check okay uh, what compositions do we have for this uh, specific patient and um, another uh, nice thing is uh, that we can check via postman if uh, the open air or air base endpoints are available and working properly, what we can see over here. So we can uh, we can request uh, the health endpoint of the airbase. And then we can see if uh, everything is uh, running correctly. And also uh, we can we can check, okay, what airbase version do we exactly use so then we uh, need to request the info endpoint and uh, yeah that's what happens in uh, these uh, applications or little tools that i just showed so you can also check these things manually via postman and uh, also uh, uh, other things that i can do as a tenant admin is i can upload some templates and I can create some users for my tenant. Um, I will not doing this, but you can see that there are several uh, users with different roles. And yeah, as a tenant admin, I can create them by clicking here on the add user and then uh, select some roles. This was the part about the admin monitoring. So <clears throat> moving on to our third persona, we have a doctor that uh, also helps his department to develop 
dynamic forms and other uh, aids. So, so he is actually providing some new medical content for the airbase. And uh, we have uh, solutions that support and can integrate a lot of different uh, uh, form tools, so to say. So as long as the, the tool we use to create the forms is, is compatible with the standards, uh, we can uh, integrate it. And we will showcase uh, briefly how we can start working with CAMView forms and then integrate that to uh, our uh, Airbase. Uh, please, Berger. Um, then I would like to grab the screen. So I think Daniel will have to close. It's you. Now it should work. Right. So now you should see the um, login screen for um, the Cambio forms. Uh, just to mention, we are also supporting uh, the Metblocks UI. And in the past, there was also this uh, Russian company called Solid Clouds, which we also successfully integrated. So we are really trying to, um, let's say, be as open and uh, independent as uh, possible when it comes to these kind of integrations. So we can log in. And uh, I'm just making an assumption. I guess some of you will know this tool already from Cambio. And maybe in the, one of the next sessions, I don't know. Uh, but I think as a Swedish vendor, there's a chance that they are also going to present. And so I will not go into the details of the forms. I will just show um, quickly how this works. And uh, the query details will, will be then left um, for another session. So what we have here is a list of um, the different uh, templates. And then we can pick one of these templates and we want to have a use case in the context of the cardiological anamnesis and then we can say create a form and then on the left hand side we have different uh, functionalities um, what is important here is that we get our data structure from our open air template and we have this canvas in the middle that allows us to drag and drop and the different data items. So one spoiler, this is not going to be a beautiful form, but it's going to be a working form. So what we can do is, for example, double click, and we are already getting this vital signs section, this systolic diastolic, presence and rate. And then we can also add the other data elements. So I think I need to select this one. body assessment and maybe just doing some smaller tweakings like the body fat percentage needs to be provided as a percent type and for example for the body segment name for this archetype we have to provide the body segment and we can assume that this is going to be our default uh, value and because it's a default we might just hide it. Uh, so we have more functionality for the layouting. It's multi-language. Technically, you can also integrate um, some functions uh, like, like smaller scripts. When if you are adding data that's above a certain threshold, you can show a message. Um, so more things, but let's keep it simple for now for the sake of demonstration. So we have built our form. So there's a preview of the form, so we could already type in data, but this is enough for us for our case, and we can save the form. So let's make a new version. And then this should be saved. So now we can go to our platform, to HIPCDR, and this will be shown here. Apologies, I will have to connect to my VPN, so give me one second. Yeah, back. So we have one specific tenant. We can log in with a tenant administrator. So we can do this and we have the templates and 
in our example, we already uploaded our template that's needed to store data in accordance to the form, which is the heart analysis template. So we see our blood pressure, pulse, heartbeat, and the body assessment with the different measurements. Now we can go to the form section and see that we already have one form here, but now we can also add our form that we just created. Again, I have to juggle with Mr. Windows. So you see in the heart analysis. And now we have the conveniences like automatic validation of the data. And there could also be something like this uh, alert if we are adding something that's a bit too high. So send us the data. Method. And as you have seen with this tool, it takes literally just minutes to have a first form up and running. And then try to submit. Okay. Typically, there should be a message, but let's see. So we go to the CDR Explorer. And then we can search for different templates. Join in here, search. Yeah, and so we typically then will have some entry for the hard analysis um, uh, template. And then this can also be uh, being called from the outside because uh, this follows the REST API. So everything that you've seen here regarding the template uh, forms management is then also uh, uh, being accessible for outside uh, applications. All right. Then coming back to uh, our presentation. So uh, <clears throat> the next uh, 36. Now you can just step forward otherwise. Sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah. So the next uh, topic here is is when when our doctor is uh, working on his research projects, he wants to be able to uh, uh, set up methods where where he can use uh, uh, certain combinations and and uh, criteria to search for relevant patients for uh, his uh, work. And he doesn't want to restart and do this again and again all the time. So he wants to save save this and uh, also tweak it and, and reuse it for other uh, open EHR data sets and so forth. And we want to showcase a, uh, a tool that, that, uh, that we have uh, developed for COVID research in Germany that uh, I think addresses this uh, topic uh, really nicely. So Berger, if you want. Yes, sure. So this um, was developed uh, beginning in 2020 together with the German university hospitals uh, for integrating routine data from the university hospitals. So we have 35 um, hospitals uh, delivering data and it's uh, based on open air and the architect query language providing reusable building blocks that can be used by researchers to build cohorts and apply for data access in this platform and uh, through the portal. And uh, the solution is available under Apache 2 license. Um, and I can provide a GitHub link afterwards if you're interested. So what I will show you with the uh, platform is how I can create a patient cohort for a research project, um, explore the number of available patients, select data for the extraction. Additionally, I can also define my research team who should get access to the data once this uh, access has been allowed. 
and then I can submit a data access request. Then I will switch roles, so don't get confused. Um, I will switch roles and become a member of an ethics committee, and I can apply. Uh, sorry, I can can acknowledge the research and uh, then allow data access to the group. And then, as a researcher, I can finally access the data and finally, as a system administrator. I can show you how you can build new criteria using no code, low code uh, approach. So we have the uh, login screen, and I will log in as a researcher. And so there's an overview about all the different uh, projects and the number of different criteria that are available. And it should be said that. From a technical point of view, it's not related to COVID-19 at all. So it means if you have a use case in the area of oncology, cardiology, whatever, this is extensible using the uh, power of open air for being really flexible. So as a researcher, I can then define a project, which I will use to apply for um, accessing the data. On the very top, you see the cohort editor that we will take a look at uh, in a second. And then for applying, of course, you will have to have some, some good reason why you should access the data. Uh, so you provide a project title, you need a description of the project, some research hypothesis, and also giving some, um, some information about how you are getting financed, if you are under the GD GDPR, so if you are residing in the European Union, uh, and so on. So, but now let's come back to the cohort editor, and you see already that there is um, one criterion. And on the left hand side, you see different uh, sections. And on the right hand side, you see the canvas where we can put the different inclusion and exclusion criteria for defining our patient cohort. So we have a first group, which is um, based on the vaccination status of a patient. So we'll be interested in the patients um, which have been vaccinated against, against uh, COVID-19. There's a second group, and this is about the discharge type. So we want to find patients which unfortunately deceased during their hospital stay or have been referred to palliative care um, during the stay. So in the third group, we are interested only in patients that had a stay in the intensive care unit. And then finally, we have also an exclusion criteria that we will see in a second. Um, so this is about the smoking status uh, of the patient. And yeah, you can see the I think long encoded uh, terminology for the different uh, drop down uh, items. And every time that you are changing your cohort, you can already check how many patients are matching the criteria inside our open air database. And now I decide, okay, I want to exclude data with the certain smoking status. And finally, I select the parameters that I'm interested in. So the cohort definition might be quite different from what data I'm interested in, because, for example, we um, didn't provide any information about uh, lab data and uh, or the diagnoses uh, that might come with the patients, a secondary uh, diagnosis. Uh, and so this can be chosen here, uh, in this case, based on uh, open air templates. And then we can also provide um, researchers that should be part of our research group and this can be uh, bound to organizations or cross organizational and finally we will apply for accessing the data so this means in the next step we are logging in again uh, let's see if this is skip sorry Work. So now I'm in the role. Okay, this is really tricky. Okay, so now finally I'm now in the role as an uh, ethics member committee. 
and I will get a list of uh, projects that have been um, provided and have been applied for. And so I will see all the data. I see what needs to be uh, provided back. And then I can basically do a review and provide the result and say, OK, I can uh, acknowledge the project, or I can ask for a revision, or this can be uh, declined uh, finally. So once this is done, I can now should now be able to access the data. So I'm now again the researcher or a member of the research group. And then there is a preview for the data. And it's flattening the data from the open air compositions and providing in various uh, tables. So I see the vaccination data, I see the lab values, and I see the diagnoses. Um, and so I can take a look if I have all the parameters that I'm uh, interested in. And finally, I can download the data using a JSON structure or a CSV, which then I can load into my favorite analytics tool, R, SPSS, SAS, whatever. Yes, so CSV export. And then I would also like to show you how we can create new criteria. So there's a criteria editor. And to create a new criteria for the cohort definition, I have to enter a name. I also have to provide some reason, uh, sorry, yeah, why, why I allow this kind of query. So this is about the uh, retrieval of diagnoses. And then I also have to explain how I can uh, use this as a researcher. So I will have to provide the um, code for the specific uh, diagnoses at runtime. So I have this editor. I can select from the open air template. So we have this um, wizard on the right hand side where I can define the rare criteria. So we have the name of the problem, we have the time of uh, occurrence, um, the severity, and um, when the issue, the problem had been uh, resolved. And now we can decide if these should be provided, this parameter should be provided by the researcher at runtime, or we are predefining a query. So we could for example, say um, we have a predefined query for patients with diabetes. Uh, then we can just select from the list and we have already the SNOMED codes and maybe the ICD codes available and make the life for the researcher a bit easier. But in this case, we want to show how we can um, allow uh, degrees of freedom to the researcher by making these uh, accessible and um, provided at, at the runtime. And so you can see, I can here provide this normal code for the chronic kidney disease uh, disorder and uh, could also provide some information about um, the time when this has been um, observed first in the patient. Uh, Birger, I think that, that we actually need to uh, move Same forward. Thing, yes. Speaking of time, we are uh, running short of it. Yep. This part is also just long. to uh, move on to this last case with with uh, the super user, and uh, that is to create reports. So, so could you just very quickly show how we can create a, a, a overview of a group of patients that we, for example, have in home monitoring? Yes, I will do so. Um, so we don't have a dedicated tool uh, from a local perspective, um, but anyway, we think there's some good case of using, um, for example, the archetype query language and some standard uh, web development components to get there quite quickly. Uh, and what I will show you was the result of basically three days uh, of work. So what we are doing here is we are accessing the data from inside the hospital and the data has been coming from um, the mobile app that we have seen earlier with uh, different uh, parameters. And uh, so this is an Angular application uh, and some, some uh, HTML, uh, showing the data on a daily basis, uh, some JS chart, um, plotting the blood pressure, and this score about the overall uh, feeling of the patient, 
the uh, well-being. Uh, and this can be combined with different data from the hospital information system, as an example. So we have SEG results and um, the values from the lab and could also be combined with some medication. And as mentioned, as we're using the AQL, it's quite easy to obtain the data. We only have to know the templates and then uh, we can get to the data quite quickly. And so we think this is quite a nice way of building these kind of uh, dashboards even without, let's say, having a heavy framework uh, around. Yeah, and I think it's good that we can combine user-generated data with, with hospital data in this. Absolutely. And now going over to, to the clinical decision support, uh, since we are running a bit over time, can you just briefly, uh, Augustine, uh, mm -hmm. talk us through what we can do in terms of plugins and event triggers to, to support decision support? Yeah, um, here uh, with, uh, do you hear me? Yeah. With HIP CDR, it is possible to create uh, event trigger as uh, Daniel explained before with the fire example, okay? But here we, I'm going to explain how it's possible to create this event trigger uh, using the event trigger plugin of HIP CDR and Kafka. Uh, the idea is to capture the events of a Kafka through a Kafka connector, okay? And depending on how we have defined in, in a series of criteria in the uh, in event trigger, uh, one thing or another will be done in the CDR. Okay, so for example, uh, when new data is transferred to the to the platform, um, the system can automatically check what type of examination it is, um, whether the defining threshold value has been accessed. Uh, in the slide, uh, you can see a resume of the solution that we are going to implement in Catalonia. Okay, uh, using Kafka and the event tri event trigger plugin. The idea is that uh, every time something is written in, in a specific Kafka topic, uh, we will capture it. And depending on the rules of the plugin event trigger, uh, we will use the collected data in one way or in another. In another. Great. Um, if we move forward, uh, when we are looking at the external actors or the external developer, uh, we actually tried to, to build a, a small front end for the HIP CDR as an example of what you can do from, from, uh, from scratch with uh, a limited effort, just to show how uh, this can be done. And, and also uh, looked at which resources that are available for, for a, an external developer. So could you please uh, show mm -hmm. us really yeah. quickly? Going to... Sure. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, here, uh, you as a developing the healthcare se sector uh, want to be able to build your application as quickly and, and reliable as possible. Okay. So uh, for this, you need to have accelerators that uh, allow allow you to understand the system that are being used and how they are handling the data that you want to exploit or that you want to manage, okay? So uh, in our case, with Airbase and HIPCDR, uh, we have taken all this into account, making it easier for developers who want to collect data or, for example, or insert it in our system uh, to use our accelerator or so that they can develop the system in the fastest, fastest or most reliable way, okay? So uh, developers, developers have uh, they, they disposal a wide range of software development, development tools, such as, uh, for example, uh, software developer, development kits, uh, the web template um, flat formats, the OpenEHS SDK. Um, something that is very important here is that uh, open source documentation and tools are offered, making it very attractive to develop application from the developer community and we can all together help in the development, the development of the OpenEHR standard, okay? I think that it's something that is very important and has a lot of value for the OpenEHR community. So uh, also, uh, as a developer outside the healthcare environment, uh, you are not restricted in any way from setting up your application or trying to do so, okay? So there is a, a lot of public domain document, documentation, such, such as Airbase Docs, the OpenEH specification, uh, the Airbase GitHub, or the Sour UI for anyone to work with, okay? Uh, you can set up a local environment that perfectly simulates a product, 
productive environment. Um, in addition, er everything is prepared so that you can work with the tools and technologies that are daily used, such as Docker, uh, Kong, with, uh, Kong is a uh, it's an open community uh, API gateway in which you can uh, publish your, your, your APIs or key clock as an identity provider, okay? And all this makes uh, that the developments around Airbase and OpenEHR are growing because they are supporting open source development. So, um, okay, regarding this, uh, here we are going to present uh, an application that we have developed in a short time following the open EHR and Airbase documentation, okay? Uh, we have developed the application in Angular and TypeScript, connecting it with the REST app, REST APIs of Airbase. I'm going to serve this, this, okay? Okay. Perfect. Uh, for this de demo, we have used the Airbase deployed locally. Uh, but it but it could be connected to any airbase that is deployed anywhere. Um, uh, for this case, uh, we have to put ourselves in the mind of a doctor who is going to treat a, a patient. A patient, okay. And the use case is that, uh, for example, a patient arrive with or without electronic medical record. The the normal is use, use case that the patient has electronic medical record, okay. And the patient pulse is measured and the data is saved in the system for later viewing, okay. So you have a home view, um, you can uh, see all the different EHR identification that the CDR has. Uh, okay, uh, if for example, the patient uh, has an uh, electronic health record in our system, you can create it. Okay, so we have created a new electronic health record in, in our CDR, and we are going to put uh, data about the pressure of the health pressure of the of the patient and we put here the identification of the healthcare record the systolic around uh, 80 the systolic around 60 the medium 70 and the pulse okay and we can save it in our system and we have an alert that the data has been saved so we can also uh, view all the data that we have uh, saved we put here the identification of the of the patient and we can check that here's the identification of the composition and the different data that we have uh, inserted uh, before. Uh, to make sure that everything is well, I'm going to go to Postman, okay? And I'm going to make a request to the airbase that is locally deployed. I take the EH identification, I put it in a AQL, okay? This AQL will respond with the composition that we have been created. And we can check the systolic, for example. Okay, the systolic is 80. Okay, it's correct. The diastolic is 60. Okay, perfect. Um, for example, in the application, you can also see the different templates that the CTR has. Um, and that's all. Okay, so I come back okay. to the presentation and this. Okay. So uh, just for a very brief wrap up, as we are a few minutes past time here, uh, Jan, can you and Stefan please conclude? Yeah, I mean, I think I can start concluding this. Though. I mean, uh, from our point of view, then we, we really hope that uh, this uh, demonstration and the uh, demo just showed our solution and our capability just to support your your, your needs here in the Swedish uh, space then. And I, and I also want, uh, want to stress that we just have experience of working with just this kind of implementation at scales. And we actually have a real evidence in solution that can handle just the open EHR implementation with millions of users. And, uh, and it's really of interest from our point of view in IBM that we have just this kind of sort of collaboration with the Vita group. And uh, it's actually an example in Catalonia that have just proven that we just have capabilities that are just a, a really a good match. Uh, and our solution, as we think, is a really true open source. Uh, and we are all, all um, both parties committed to the overall open source community. 
and and also perhaps you all see see real clear that we have a really good understanding of the health context here in Sweden related to just our knowledge and implementation of just the largest EMR systems just in in VDR in Skåne. So Stefan, do you do you have any additional thoughts that you want to share? Why we are just a unique combination, uh, IBM and Vita Group? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, almost everything has been said. Uh, this is what I wanted to uh, state as well. Uh, I think, meanwhile, uh, through uh, the scope of the RFI in Catalonia and the RFP, uh, and uh, now eventually uh, winning all the, also the project, I think we are now a, a proven team, IBM and Vita Group. Uh, I think uh, hopefully you've seen that, uh, you know, we uh, complement each other very, very well. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of experience uh, of similar projects of the same size, both project based uh, as well as solution based. Um, and what is, I think what is important for you to understand that, uh, you know, specifically in Catalonia, this is, uh, you know, for us uh, and for IBM, it's also kind of a blueprint project uh, where we, of course, uh, have uh, collected also the experience of, uh, you know, having large scales infrastructure, uh, which with uh, very challenging uh, expectations in read and write times, as well as, uh, you know, number of compositions being stored, number of uh, concurrent access uh, users and these kind of things. So all of this uh, has been developed. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing you know, that, uh, you know, can can take us uh, beyond uh, what has been already experienced. So I think um, uh, we, or I hope uh, that uh, you've collected this uh, through the presentation and the various demos um, that uh, we actually know what we are doing here. And then Good, I think thanks. we will have to stop the presentation so that we can continue with the questions. We have, I think, eight questions in the chat so should we just go through them from top to bottom yeah i think that is the best one and then, then we can see who is the most suited person to 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 answer yes um well do you want me to read them out I, loud? I can i can uh, dispatch the questions if you want uh, so so the first question is uh, regarding abac and and our solution for that when will it be available for production use and i don't know if that is for you stefan or for burger yes i think i can can answer uh, i would say it depends um because i mentioned we understand abac as something that you can put into multiple stages depending if you are considering um the request data and the role data and maybe then finally the response data and maybe even some uh, outside data um so let's say in the full full stage really on data level i would assume later this year but hopefully by the end of this year um let's say on a earlier stage as discussed today where you can say i can prevent requests based on the um, request data um, this should be available earlier i guess uh, around uh, autumn this year Great. Uh, and the second question here is features related to to uh, support Swedish laws. Uh, have you started developing uh, investigating this and how fast of an order would you expect to be able to deliver this? And, and just regarding the Swedish laws, as, as I said a few words about earlier, the, the biggest uh, hurdle uh, in our experience and, and in, in our experience together with, with uh, Oracle Cerner is really the, the, the PDL and, and the restrictions in data access. That is really not um, the, the situation in, in most other markets where, where they wor uh, work. So I think this question is a little bit related to this uh, ability to, to uh, provide uh, granular access control. Uh, I don't know if Berger or Daniel is, is the most suited to, to, to say something about this. Or maybe Augustine also have some, some thoughts about this with uh, the granular access control based on attributes and, and, and metadata. Yeah, maybe maybe again, I think it really depends on the level that's really required. And I saw the, the documents uh, in the wiki and uh, the discussion. 
Um, so, so just to give an example, what we are typically uh, coming across is the question about patient consent and if they can really ex uh, manage their access to different uh, providers. And then the question is on what detailed level. So because if we are talking about filtering out specific LOINC codes from uh, lab values, uh, then it's going to be uh, at least a tough challenge. Let's say if we want to have this for arbitrary data, because uh, then you have a bully big matrix in the end. And so it's not going to be easy. So if we're saying this is happening on a document level or on, on an uh, episode of care level, um, so we are talking about template IDs um, and maybe with the uh, complementation of some uh, open air tags for providing, for example, the confidentiality level of a document. So it's maybe a bit more similar to what we know from IHG XDS, then I think it's way more manageable, but I'm not sure if there's a final decision uh, how, let's say, the level of control for the patients should look like in the end. And I think this will highly determine the complexity on this topic. I think that the main level is, is on, a, on a clinic level. So, so to say that you don't share data clinic to clinic, that, that I think is the most, uh, most important hurdle, really. Yes. But let's say if this is um, where it stops, then I think uh, there is a good alignment with what we are developing. And so I don't think there's too many extras uh, needed, but yeah, devil is always in the detail. Yeah. And what do you say about the timeline in, in that specific case, the, the latter one? You mean for the uh, basic one based on organizations and affiliation? Yeah, yeah. based on, on, on clinics or, or organizations. Yeah, again, I think uh, what I mentioned later this year, maybe yeah. later, autumn, maybe December, because the problem is I'm product manager, so I'm always a bit optimistic and then developers say it's not that easy, you know, <laughs> so uh, take this with a bit of grain of salt. Um, yeah, but we're working on that. And I think it's it's basically a good fit. Uh, maybe just one comment, um, because we mentioned a multi tendency. And um, so I think we just had, a, let's say, a different understanding of multi-tenancy because it, now it sounds like we have one database and in your case, and then this should be really only controlled by access rights, whereas we have some logical, let's say, separation using role level security on the database level, where you would have then to make a copy to get from one tenant to the other, where in the, your case, it's completely controlled to understanding regarding access rights. So this is a bit more challenging from where we started, but I think still doable. Uh, the third question uh, relates to, to how we deliver open air services in Catalonia and how it would differ from, from how we would want to deliver those in uh, Sweden in terms of uh, server co-location on site, response times requirements regarding AQL. I, okay, I think that I can answer this question. Okay. Uh, that's right. In Catalonia, we're going to implement a solution based in uh, two different clusters that are not physically located in the same place. Okay. And we have prepared uh, all architecture based on the technology that it's open shift, vale? uh, Okay. To be able to build this architecture. Uh, the nice thing about the proposed architecture and the delivery plan is that it is almost transparent in the way that it is deployed, okay? Uh, it can be deployed in a public cloud or in a hybrid cloud, uh, preferring one or more deploying clusters. So it can be perfectly adapted to each of your needs or, or the rest of the needs with almost no changes. And regarding the time of uh, AQLs, okay? Uh, certain criteria of response time must be met. Um, for this, uh, different configuration will be made. Okay, uh, well, we are going to implement a series of read-only replicas that will be updated from the CDR center, uh, making the read much faster and meeting all the requirements that uh, Catalonia asked. Yeah, uh, and I think that we have a lot of, of uh, regions in Sweden, and, and it could could be that that we want uh, to have uh, individual instances or or uh, perhaps uh, uh, common hosting with with uh, logical uh, sharing. But uh, let's move on to the next question: uh, Is it possible to filter out prohibited data coming from a certain composition? 
from certain composition instances in AQL responses based on access policies, e.g. using some combination of row level security and ABAC uh, or other ways that's maybe for you, Berger. Yeah, uh, as mentioned uh, so far, um, for the uh, request, yes, we can analyze what's in the AQL and make a decision based on the AQL query, but not yet on the uh, other way around. Uh, and I think the main challenge is uh, also regarding the performance, um, because if you have a bigger value set and you have to analyze everything, then you will have to do this uh, ideally on the database level and not in an external component. So again, working on that, but not there yet. And the next question concerns the PSPL, the protocol specific path language. Uh, is that uh, invented by, by you or uh, is it some kind of open source specification? And where can we find documentation about it? Daniel, maybe you uh, can elaborate on that. Yeah, please speak. I think you know better than, than me. Okay, yeah, I can, can explain. Uh, so PPL is something uh, that's uh, our own development. Um, so it's not in the sense uh, standard. We have been uh, in a couple of meetings with Beta um, because I think there was a need in the community to define these uh, mappings once. Uh, but we understand it as something that would be a layer uh, above let's say the technical uh, implementation for exchanging these kind of mappings. And I think this would be the right approach to say um, there is standardization taking place um, between the vendors, but for the internal processing, there might be some variations uh, on that. So, so from this point of view, this is proprietary technology. Okay, good. And the next one in the terminology server that you use, is it possible to create or use a value set that contains a mix of codes from different code systems? Yes, that's possible in Onto Server. Quick answer on that one. And, and uh, number seven, uh, I don't know if this is for Berger or for Agustin, maybe. How is the compatibility? compatibility with other container solutions. So if we are not running on OpenShift, but rather VMware Tansu, for example. Um, do you want to answer it bigger or Daniel? Or I can I, answer I, it I, if you I want. I can say something. So we haven't tried it or certified with Tansu. Actually, it's not my, my turf, so I'm not that familiar, but uh, we didn't come across. For uh, OpenShift, we uh, also provide the certification. And so this is officially supported, not ruling out that this can be uh, used. Um, so I'm not sure how compatible Tanzu is to Kubernetes. So if they are compliant uh, to, let's say, the API, then I don't see any problem. But yeah, we would have to try. Yeah, um, and something to add to Bieber comment, uh, I was uh, doing some uh, configuration in Podman, something that is different from Docker, and Erase and the rest of Plugin uh, were running well. So I think it's something that it's transparent for the technology of the container solution, I think. Yeah, and, and uh, IBM in general is, is agnostic mm -hmm. in this sense. So we have no like uh, affiliation to, to Red Hat, even if Red Hat is an IBM company. So we can work with, uh, with the Tansu as well, if, 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 uh, if you would prefer that. Um, the last question, most information in a patient record must be archived at some point. Is it possible to export the information in uh, e.g. XML? What role does FIRE play in this, if any? Okay, I think we can also answer. So we don't have, let's say, one standard adapter for archive systems because I think there is none. So it's always uh, some kind of custom integration that needs to be done. Uh, then of course, it's the discussion, what is the right format? And yeah, we have different uh, ways we can also provide the data in uh, XML. My personal take so far is, I think we would have the um, open air EHR extract, um, maybe as a good archiving format. And for fire, I, I'm not sure yet, to be honest. So maybe also just the XML 
uh, serialization of a fire um, might have to be it's integrated with some sort of bulk export which we don't have at the moment but yeah let's say it's to be done uh, and again depending on the projects uh, so far we have a quite large footprint uh, on the German hospital market and uh, yeah this is also something that's always uh, to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis unfortunately yeah and I think that there are a lot of types of data in, in the three different data stores the, the files the, the demography and, and airbase and, and we need to ensure that that all the data is, is archived of course uh, one more question from, from Eric here. Um, is the terminology server onto server that you mentioned included in the platform bundling and any associated content maintenance tools? Yes, so we uh, also provide the commercial offering together with onto server, if that's possible. And yes, um, there is the additional tool like uh, Shrimp and, and Snapper. And uh, yeah, we made this uh, maybe just one more comment because we have one minute left. Uh, so we have um, made this reference implementation, you can say, um, for the uh, Corona data platform, uh, which used the HiMed instance of onto server, which is uh, serving uh, right now, I think it's around 14 hospitals. Uh, 10 of uh, them are university hospitals. And so I think it's one of the first instances of a national terminology service uh, that we have in, in Germany. And uh, for the future projects, we are also using the syndication service um, of the onto server so that you can have a cascade of um, inheriting the terminologies and value sets uh, from the national service to the local one which is using it for which is used for operations inside the hospitals or between the local hospital networks. We got one more question now, and, and that is what is the main difference between the open source and the commercial offering of the platform? And that may be a question for you, Stefan. Yeah, I unmuted myself already. Um, yeah, the main difference is, of course, uh, you know, it's a guaranteed service level. Um, uh, if there are support issues on the GitHub, uh, then certainly uh, it's also uh, being replied and uh, worked on. But uh, uh, one of uh, the guaranteed service levels is one of the main differences. But there's also tools and plugins uh, that are, you know, make the difference, basically, which is uh, in regards also of the uh, usability or uh, any kind of uh, tool sets uh, that make it, uh, you know, from uh, uh, headless technology or um, CDR to something that can easily be used uh, and integrated. And also one, uh, one big difference is uh, all the mapping parts. Um, uh, so the CDR bridge is uh, on the commercial side, it's on the HIP CDR side. And maybe to, to complement Stefan, so we have this topic of multi-tendency and the multi management. Yes. We have a big topic, and this is not more the technical details, but I think it's a good question uh, regarding transaction compensation. As mentioned, we have around 40 services being started uh, at once when you start the HIP CDR. And uh, so this means that you have to take care of transactions across the different services, uh, including rollbacks. And so we have this compensation logic uh, as part of the uh, platform. And, and as mentioned in the beginning, uh, you are uh, setting up the platform in Kubernetes and all the services are um, being uh, bootstrapped. So this means you have your uh, identity provider ready, you have your uh, Atna repository ready, and all the components are just working together seamlessly. And so this plays a major role if you think about uh, update management and operations of the platform. So it's quite a lot what you will find beyond one, um, let's say, single Airbus instance um, uh, from the, let's say, operations point of view and from the infrastructure point of view. Hey, I think you asked for uh, a couple of minutes without recording. Or do I remember it wrong? No, we, we did. Yeah, yeah should we? So, uh, there are a few minutes left. Shall we just stop the recording then? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>